Foster from the School of Physics and I'll be hosting uh, this evening. It's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in our July lecture series this year. And you'll just note uh, from uh, the panel here uh, that we have one more to go next year, uh, which will be Anne Roberts uh, next Friday. So this evening we have Professor Stuart White, who's uh, delivering a lecture on distant light, reading the signals from the oldest light in the universe. Stuart has been in the School of Physics, well he's been around the School of Physics for quite a long time, uh, but he's actually been on faculty for about a dozen years. Uh, and I think he was perhaps our fastest rising, fastest promoted professor in the department, uh, so uh, quite, quite a distinction. Uh, he, his, his main area of research is, um, is theoretical, uh, where he uh, spends his time modelling the very earliest times in the universe. And I hope this evening he'll at least give you a little taste uh, of what it is that he's discovering about those very early times. Uh, so please welcome uh, Stu White to the podium. Stars that are not 
predominantly in the plane, in the disk of our Milky Way, but they're distributed around in a more spherical fashion. And on the left, we see the radio, and this is dominated by radiation produced by electrons moving in the galaxy's magnetic field. So as we look at different wavelengths of light, we see the galaxy in different ways, and the same is true um, of the rest of the universe. So I'm going to concentrate tonight on, on talking about what we can learn about the early universe uh, from looking in optical infrared light, the light that we're most used to thinking about when we talk about galaxies. And I'm going to talk about uh, what we can learn about the, the very early universe uh, at radio wavelengths. So a very important uh, quantity um, for tonight's talk, the, sort of the key principle, uh, is the finite speed of light. In our everyday existence, light appears to travel at, at an effectively infinite speed, but it doesn't travel at, at an infinite speed, it travels at a, at a finite speed. Um, and this was first uh, discovered using astronomical objects, uh, in particular our solar system, the moons of Jupiter, and the motion of Earth's orbit. And what was noticed is that if you look at, um, if you look at the moons of Jupiter, they're, they're circling Jupiter, and they should circle in a regular fashion. So we see one orbit, uh, of the moon around Jupiter every uh, so many days. But what was observed was that at times when the Earth was further away from Jupiter, those orbits uh, took longer, and when we were closer to Jupiter, those orbits took less time. And the reason for that is that when we're further away from Jupiter, the light has, has further to travel. And if it's travelling at a finite speed, it takes a bit longer. And so we saw uh, the orbits um, happening apparently a bit slower. And this is a, a key feature uh, in astronomy. The further away something is, the longer ago it happened. So how long ago? So this is a kind of powers of 10 diagram, but, but in terms of light travel time, which, which I think is quite, it's quite illustrative to look at the differences in scale. So if I look uh, at Rachel in the front row, the light has traveled uh, for around three nanoseconds to get here. And this is clearly an imperceptible um, amount of time for me. Um, it's not an unmeasurable time uh, by today's technology, but it's an extremely short time. If I look um, at a, to a satellite in, in a geostationary orbit, that time is, is around 100 milliseconds. That's, that's pretty, it's very fast, um, but it's actually a time that 10 to the second, someone can uh, perceive that time, and this is um, why we have received small delays in, in communication. Similarly, if we talk about how long does light take to go around the equator, it's around 100 milliseconds. This is a this is the sort of scale of the Earth in, in, in terms of light travel. So you can, you can move information around on the Earth uh, in, in very quick time. What if we go to our nearest uh, astronomical neighbor, the Moon? Um, light will take around 1.3 seconds to get to the Moon, and that's, that's definitely a time that we can notice. That's, that's a very long pause in a conversation, an uncomfortable pause, and if, when you listen to recordings of the moon landings, you notice this. Um, it sounds like a very awkward conversation. Now if we look to our next up, so if we look to the, towards the sun, so the light from the sun travels for about eight minutes to get here, so, so light that's now hitting the earth, um, or New Zealand at least now, um, that light left the sun at around about when I started my talk, and so this is, you know, this is a clearly a, it's, there's a, a real delay here. We're not seeing the sun as it is now. We're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Something could have happened to the sun in the meantime. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know about it. The sun is our nearest star. What about the next nearest star? Well, light has uh, taken around four years to get to us from the nearest star. And now we're talking about a, a significant period of time. We can't communicate effectively with, with if, if there were a civilization here, we would, it would take four years each way for our information to go back and forth. This is a long time. So this is, light has left uh, these stars at the time when our, uh, our current master students were, were just leaving high school. What about the, the center of our galaxy? If we come back to this picture that I showed before, well, <coughs> From the Earth to the centre of the Milky Way, that's light that's left 40,000 years ago. So this is now, we're talking light that's travelled for the entirety of, of the oldest civilizations uh, that we know of. If we look towards the next nearest galaxy that's large like our own, we're now talking about two and a half million years. So 
in an extremely long time scale. So this is just uh, the closest galaxy, Andromeda. We can still see Andromeda in, on, on a clear night, almost with the naked eye, certainly with binoculars. This is a, this is a, a near, relatively nearby uh, object in cosmological terms. But we can keep going to further and further away galaxies. This is an image that I'll come back to uh, again in the talk. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and it's the it's a, it's a region of sky where the, the, the faintest uh, observations have been have been taken. And it's a, a region of the sky much smaller than the, the full moon, and it, it contains many thousands of galaxies. And if you zoom in on these images, you see many, many galaxies further and further away. And so the question is, how long does it take light to get to the most distant galaxies that we've seen so far? And now that the time becomes truly large, um, to the oldest stars that we've observed, the, the travel time for that light is around 13.2 billion years. But that's not the oldest light that we've seen. The oldest light that we've seen um, comes from something called the cosmic microwave background. And this is um, the edge of our observable universe. I'll, I'll come back to why that is in a, in a moment. And that, that's a time of 13.7 billion years ago. This is, um, this is a time around 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And this is uh, when we talk about the age of the universe. This is the, this is the age that we're, uh, we're talking about. So by by looking deeper and deeper into, into the universe, astronomers have constructed a history of, of how we think the universe goes, and that's captured in, in this cartoon. So on the bottom of axis is, is time. It runs from uh, time equals zero to 13.7 billion years, which is, is our estimate of the current, uh, current age of the universe. So the universe started with a big bang, uh, and at that time, the universe was extremely dense, many billions of times as dense as it is today. And, and very very hot, and it was um, it was it didn't have structure like it did today. It was very smooth, uh, and it, with very small fluctuations in density. It was uh, comprised of, of radiation, light, um, and and charged particles, principally electrons and protons. And those electrons and protons prevented the light from from travelling very far. So we don't see we can't see that universe because the light. Uh, that we would observe to see it was, was bouncing around, uh, scattering off the charged particles. But as the universe expanded after the Big Bang, it cooled. Um, if you take a gas and you expand it, it cools down. And, and if, this, if hydrogen gas in particular cools below uh, around about 10,000 Kelvin, the electron and the proton will, will combine. It's energetically more favorable to have a hydrogen atom. And once that happens, there are no charged particles in filling the universe anymore, just hydrogen atoms. And, and the photons, the light, can then travel. And that's what we're seeing when we look at the cosmic microwave background in the previous slide. We're seeing light that was, for the first time, allowed to travel through the universe, and it's done so uh, for the full 13.7 billion years since the universe cooled below that critical temperature. So when you look at the cosmic microwave background here, this is again one of these maps where we're looking at the inside of a, of a sphere. What you're looking at is, is radiation. It, it's, it's radiation at microwave uh, frequencies. And it's almost completely uniform across the sky. There's fluctuations in, we measure the radiation in terms of temperature, and it's one part in 10 to the 4 uh, Kelvin of temperature difference between a little red patch here and a little blue patch. But these have been measured with exquisite accuracy. and and they, these, and these little fluctuations are extremely important. What they, what they encode for us is, is how the universe was not quite smooth at that time. It had very small fluctuations in density, and, and it's those fluctuations in density that gave rise to all of the galaxies and all of the clusters of galaxies that we can see. So we can make a statistically a very precise uh, model for for how this. Uh, this cosmic microwave background looks. It's, it's really one of the, the, the triumphs of cosmology. And we can take those statistics, how much, den how many, how big a fluctuation, <laughs> or how much bigger than average you have in density as a function of, of size in the early universe. And then I can take a cubic region of, of model universe and fill it with, with dark matter, okay, or with, with matter that and interacts gravitationally, some places it's a little bit denser than other places with statistics that match what I've learned from the cosmic microwave background. 
So in a, in a cube like this, which has a side length of about uh, 400 million uh, light years or so, it, a modern simulation like this will contain um, 10 or 20 billion individual interacting uh, gravitational particles. And I can, I can then use the supercomputer to run this forward under gravity. And what you see is that these very little tiny fluctuations act as seeds where more material will gravitationally attract and they, they condense out of this almost uniform medium into lots of little objects, all these little bright spots here are regions where dark matter has, has gravitationally fallen in to create a, a dense environment. And those, those little dense environments, of which there are thousands in this simulation, they don't randomly appear in the box. They appear in a very structured way, along sheets and filaments which intersect in particularly dense regions like you see in the middle of that box. So if we have our theory right and we understand the cosmic microwave background and we understand gravity and, and we, we've measured everything correctly, then we should go from the cosmic microwave background and we should see this in our nearby universe. Now the problem is that we don't see dark matter, what we see is galaxies. And so when we look into, uh, into space, we see uh, large fields of galaxies. But we think that these galaxies, they lie in the centre of, of our dark matter halos. So if we make a map of the galaxies, then we can try and compare these to what we see in simulation. So this is a, on the top there, this is a, a map of, of a region of nearby universe that was made at the, um, the, the Australian Astronomical Observatory, Kuna Barabrand. And what you're looking at there is kind of like a pizza slice in the sky. So along the straight axis from the middle, you have distance out away from us, and then you have angle. And each dot on the sides of those diagrams is, a, is the location in space of one, of one galaxy that's had its distance and, <coughs> and location observed. And there are 60,000 galaxies in this uh, picture. This total survey was 200,000 galaxies. There are now even larger surveys. But what you can see qualitatively is that if you look at how those galaxies are distributed in space, they're not random. They're, they appear in, in this same sort of cosmic web that our dark matter simulations show. And if you analyse the statistics of how this clustering is, uh, is arranged in detail, you find that, in fact, you can, you, you can match precisely the statistics of the galaxies in the nearby universe and compare with a simulation that starts at the cosmic microwave background, as long as you get the amount of dark matter in the universe and the amount of uh, normal matter in the universe, the amount of dark energy in the universe, correct. And this is how this is how astronomers have, have measured the quantities in this famous pi diagram. This is, this is our, the result that we've heard so much about over the last decade, where the universe is, is comprised 70% dark energy, 26% dark matter, some 4% of ordinary matter like, uh, like we find in this room, so-called baryonic matter. This is a, this is a real triumph for cosmology. It's, it's, these quantities are measured very precisely. And so the question, uh, that we should ask is whether or not cosmology is done. And, and cosmology is certainly not done, and it's not done for at least two reasons. Um, uh, the first reason is that the dark matter and dark energy uh, that we see in that making up 96% of that diagram are not, are not understood, and there's many, many efforts worldwide to try and determine, to better determine the properties of the dark matter and dark energy, to try and, to try and understand what they are experimentally, theoretically, and also through cosmology, cosmological observations. But the galaxies which we've used as traces, really, of where the dark matter has gone in order to probe the cosmology, these galaxies are not, it's not, it's not understood how they form. Um, we, we've, we've learned quite a bit, um, but it's not understood how they form, and it's particularly not understood how or when the first galaxies in the universe form. And that's what I want to spend uh, my time talking about tonight. So if I come back to my, my history diagram here, I spoke about the cosmic microwave background. I showed a, a simulation of, of, of dark matter providing sites where galaxies could form and how we can create a map of where that dark matter is by looking at galaxies nearby 13.7 billion years. And our theory can take us from this, this cosmic microwave background down to the present day. In between, the first galaxies must have formed at some time. 
And we think that was likely to have happened around three, four, five hundred million years after the Big Bang, but we don't, we haven't observed that. Um, we don't know that. I mentioned also that, that at the time of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the, the charged particles, the electrons and the protons, had combined to form hydrogen gas. And that gas filled the universe uh, at, at a very early time. Today that gas is, is very highly ionised. It's back to its original proton and electron state. And the reason for that is that the stars that formed a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, those stars have, uh, they produced copious amounts of ultraviolet radiation of the sort that we saw uh, in our early picture of the, the galaxy at the start of this talk. And that radiation breaks the hydrogen and it ionizes it back to its original state. So this is, this is, the, this is what this orange uh, shading, fading to black, is showing there. It's this very important event of so-called reionization, where hydrogen, uh, new, atomic hydrogen gas was, was broken back into its constituent proton and electron. So I'm going to come back to this, to this reionization event, which is why I've mentioned it now. Now, how do we, we know all of this? Well, I've already given you the answer. It's because the, the finite speed of light means that if we look at more distant sources, those sources are being observed not as they are today, but how they were very far in the past. And the further we look, the older the, the source. So if we look, we can look all the way back to the cosmic microwave background and observe the universe as it was when, when the universe was only 300,000 years old. Um, we can look at the moon, see it as it was uh, one and a half seconds ago, and, and we can look everywhere in between and see, try and map out the whole history of the universe. So this is, a, in analogy, this is cosmic archaeology, if you like. It's, we, we, it's unavoidable. As we look further away, we're looking at older things. Um, as you dig down uh, under, in, in interesting places in the world, you can find older and older things as, as civilizations are built on top of what's come before, and, and so we're doing, we're doing this on a, on a cosmic scale. Now, in addition to the finite speed of light, which, which means, that, means that we can look at further and further uh, objects and, and see them as they were longer and longer ago, um, <coughs> this is extremely important. At, as, but as, as we look further and further back uh, into the universe, the, we, we know that the universe has, has expanded. And, and if we look further and further away, we see a universe which is, ex, which is expanding more and more quickly the further we look. Um, so this is a property of, we believe this is a property of our universe. It's true of all, all parts of the universe. Wherever you are in space, if you, look, if you look further away, you'll see objects which are receding from you at ever greater speed. And this is known as Hubble's Law. It was first observed uh, more than 100 years ago not around 100 years ago. It does something very important to the light. Um, you'll know that if you're, if you're standing on the footpath and, and there's a, a, a car with a siren coming, a police car or ambulance, you hear, you hear the pitch of the siren change as the car drives past. And this is because, because the, the sound has a speed, which is finite, just like uh, light. Um, and if it's moving towards you, you, you hear a high pitch. If it's moving away, you hear a lower pitch, and this is because of the difference in arrival time of different uh, uh, cycles of the, of the sound wave. In the case of light, the physics is not the same. I'm happy to, to talk about it um, uh, if people are interested later. But but the but the analogy is so when I look at when I look at light from a galaxy that's far further away, and it's it's apparent it's receding from us at some velocity, apparently receding from us. We see light which is not observed at the frequency that it was emitted, but it's observed at a longer frequency. Okay? It's, it's something which is called redshift. And this is illustrated by this expanding ball here, where as the universe expands, the light wave, which is this uh, sinusoidal shape, is getting redder and redder as the wavelength gets longer and longer. And this is, this is a critical uh, component of our, of our understanding of using, the, using light to understand the distant universe. Now, we know from our everyday existence that if I look at an object which is further away, it looks smaller. The people at the back of the room look smaller than the ones at the front. They're not really smaller, they just look, they're just further away. So now if I, if I look at, at galaxies, and I, 
I ask, I ask, how do they look as I take them further and further away? I see them look, get smaller, and I also see them get redder. Okay, and so if I follow this sequence around, I'm, when if I look at a galaxy which is very far away, I'm observing it as it was a long time ago. It looks smaller, and the light that I'm seeing from it is redder than it, than it was at the time it was emitted. So let's talk about that, about that in, in a little bit more detail. So here I have a, a distant galaxy, and I'm going to observe it at Earth. The light from, the, from this galaxy travels, uh, comes out, and, and it comes out with a range of wavelengths, as we've said. It comes out with wavelengths all the way from, from X-ray through to radio. But I'm going to concentrate here on the region that's infrared, which is my, which is my red bar at the top that corresponds to my infrared light. At the bottom, the purple bar corresponds to my ultraviolet light, and in the middle I have the green, so that's our, that's our visible light. Okay, that light's travelling through the universe, but it's not travelling through a universe that's completely empty. Uh, it's not an empty vacuum. It's close, but it has little bits of traces of hydrogen in it, and hydrogen gas uh, is extremely efficient at, at absorbing uh, ultraviolet light of a particular wavelength. And when it does that, it removes that light from our line of sight. So if I'm looking at this galaxy, I need to look at it through a hydrogen cloud. And that hydrogen cloud removes a, some of the light from this galaxy at a particular frequency. And so I put a dashed line there to show this. Now the other thing that's happened here is that as the light has moved that, through that region of universe, closer to us. The universe has expanded in the meantime because the light has taken some period of time to travel that distance, the universe has gotten bigger, and so these photons have redshifted like we, like we saw on this expanding ball. So all of my light, you can see all of these photons, the purple one is now blue, um, the, the yellow one is, the green one is now yellow and so on, they're redshifting. So when I get to the next hydrogen cloud, I've now got another Another one of my, uh, my light that was originally at a, a much higher frequency is now uh, has wavelength expanded so that it, it too gets absorbed by the hydrogen and so on. So what I see when I get to Earth is, uh, is light from this galaxy which is much redder than it was when it left because the universe has expanded. But it's also missing a whole lot of the, the spectrum of light. A, a, lot of long, a lot of the wave frequencies, a lot of the wavelengths of that light are just not observed because they've been absorbed by the hydrogen gas on the way through. So if I look at a galaxy, I'm now, this is a, a plot which we call a spectrum, it's got wavelength of light on the x-axis and it's got how intense my object looks on that, on that y-axis. And a, a gal typical galaxy has similar amounts of light at all of these wavelengths and we're going from, from ultraviolet up to the infrared there. But because of this absorption, I don't see the low wavelength light. It's been absorbed by the hydrogen gas. And so I can use this fact to identify that my galaxy is actually at, at very high, so-called high redshift. It's at a great distance. It existed at a time when the universe was much smaller than it is now, and it was much younger. And this is how the Hubble Space Telescope has been used to, to find the most distant galaxies. That we know of. This is a case of a galaxy that existed when the universe was about 600 million years old. And what you see here is, is that in the optical wavelengths, the galaxy is not detected. It would have been there. It's only detected at the infrared wavelengths. And this is because all of this light has been absorbed, absorbed by little bits of hydrogen uh, along, along the line of sight. So I'm going to show you now um, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field again, which is the which is the, the data set in which the most distant galaxies have been found. And for scale, uh, it's being put um, in the sky here. It's this little, this little white square. And if, with that, that little patch of sky was observed for, for many days uh, with the Space Telescope. And what, what we're doing here is using this redshifting of the light, this, this expansion of the wavelength, and this absorption by hydrogen to, to to estimate how what distance these galaxies were at. 
And so we can make, although we just have an image, we can make this kind of fly through. And what you see uh, as we go through is that the galaxies get smaller and they get redder. And the further back you go, uh, these galaxies get extremely small and extremely red. And these are the these little faint red sources. Uh, these are the these are the oldest. This is the oldest light from stars that we that we've observed in the universe today. It's that light that's coming from it's been travelling for around 13.2 billion years. So what sort of galaxies are these? They're not um, uh, they're not very tiny little galaxies, although they're extremely faint. They're they're actually quite big. Not as big as the Milky Way, perhaps, but, but much bigger than some of the smaller galaxies that we see in our universe around us. And because we think that galaxies build up, they don't form in situ as very large objects. They, they build up from smaller things which merge together. We see that in our simulations. And we see that in the, in the real universe nearby. We don't believe that these, these very, very faint objects that we've seen at, with, from 13.2 billion light years away, these are not the first galaxies in the universe. There must have been something smaller, something that existed earlier, which could have merged together to form this larger system. So this is another, um, another sort of way of plotting this cartoon of the universe's history, but it's, it's, it's plotted from the, the perspective of, of the Hubble Space Telescope on the left. The current Hubble Space Telescope, with, with the technology it has, with the, the wavelengths to which it's sensitive, it can look out to a time when the universe was about 400 to 700 million years old, um, and it can't look further than that. So if we want to understand uh, what's beyond that, we'd need a, a, a more sensitive telescope, even more sensitive than the Hubble. And of course that's, that's in the works. The, this is the, the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a, it's a model of it um, with the team. Uh, team working on it, the Space Telescope. And this is a, a larger telescope. It's more sensitive to, to the further infrared than the Hubble is. It's really designed for uh, with looking for very early galaxies in mind, as well as other science cases. But this is still some years away. Um, so in the meantime, how can, we, how can we get to the first galaxies? Um, simulations, Rachel mentioned, I work on simulations, and so I, I'm, I'm biased, but simulations play a very important role uh, in, in, in studying phenomena like the early universe. We can't, you can't get anywhere with simulation alone, um, but in a lot of cases, you require simulations to interpret uh, what you see about the, real, about the real world, about the real universe. So what I'm going to show now is a, is a simulation that includes uh, gas in it and it includes stars. So here the yellow, uh, and, it's done, and you, the dark matter is, that we saw in the earlier simulation is still there, but it's not shown on this plot. Okay? So, so the blue is, is, is the, the gas and the yellow is stars. So as I run this forward, um, what you see is, is, a very, is a very violent looking interaction between, between a number of, of, of stars. You see new stars being created from the gas. You see so small, other small galaxies merging together with the original galaxy to form something bigger. This doesn't look like the kind of beautiful spiral shaped uh, object that you see in the, in the nearby universe. It looks quite different. Now this simulation run to, to, to current day, this is, this is this is very early in the universe's history. If you ran this today, you, you do start to see galaxies which are very nicely formed, like we see in our local universe. This is in the very early universe, and this is the kind of object which is existing in the middle of those uh, sheets and filaments of dark matter that I showed in the earlier simulation. Okay? So this is, a, this is an environment where we have many new stars being created. You have a lot of gas uh, falling into this dense environment. Some of it's forming stars, but not all of it. And these stars are producing an enormous amount of, uh, of radiation. And a lot of that, and new stars form, uh, produce very high energy radiation, radiation that has enough energy to, to break this atomic hydrogen gas back into its constituent proton and electron. So this is a, this is a cartoon of a hydrogen atom. Um, and and it's, it, it shows the proton and the electron. And, and we, we know from quantum mechanics that our electron, in, when it's in orbit around the proton, it can, it can be in one of eight states <laughs> okay, of different energy levels. And 
the, the electron can move up and down between energy levels um, with, through interaction with, with light of, a, of the appropriate energy or wavelength. But if my hydrogen atom interacts with a, 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 some light, a, a photon that has too much energy, then that photon will, will break the hydrogen atom and I'll have an electron and a proton which are again separate. And that's important because for, for cosmology, because for, for one reason which I'll mention now, and a second reason which I'll, I'll, I'll mention towards the end of the talk. The first reason is that is that this uh, this hydrogen gas that we see in the simulation, it's it's that the stars are forming from. This gas has a temperature of a few ten, maybe 20, 30 Kelvin. It's cold gas, and and cold gas can easily get into into these dense regions that are being being created by the dark matter, that's where the galaxies can form. But once the radiation breaks them in, back into the electron and the proton, it releases a, lot, releases a lot of energy, it makes the gas hot, it makes it 10,000 Kelvin. And that gas can't easily get in to make new stars inside galaxies. And so this process has, 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 uh, is, has great consequences for, for galaxies which form subsequently. So this realization process on, on my cartoon, this is going from, from the yellow shading that you see here. When the galaxies form, they create little regions where the gas has been ionised. Um, and as you go through, you create more and more galaxies, you create more and more regions where the hydrogen has been heated and, and ionised. And eventually, you've produced uh, one, one, light, one photon of light for every hydrogen atom in the universe, and then you've, you've ionised everything. And so, if I can observe how this, uh, this ionization change in the state of the hydrogen gas in the universe progressed, I can determine when the galaxies first uh, turned on. So let me talk about that a little bit more. So here's, here's this simulation that I started with. It's the dark matter only simulation. Again, this is, this is a region of the universe about 400,000 light years on the side. It, it contains thousands or millions of, of, of galaxies sites for galaxies, and it forms this kind of cosmic web. Now I can try and make a simulation which doesn't just have dark matter. It has, it has gas in it, it, it forms stars, the stars produce radiation, and the radiation heats and, and ionizes the hydrogen gas in this region of the universe. So that's what I'm going to show in the second simulation. So what you're seeing here now is little, the little flickering yellow lights there. Those are the new galaxies forming there. New stars, those stars are producing this radiation. And the red is the atomic hydrogen. And what you're seeing is in the regions around these new star, newly forming stars, you're seeing the radiation ionize the gas, and, and in this simulation, it's making it clear. Okay? As time goes on, you see those regions get larger and larger. They overlap and they fill this entire volume. And behind you see these little, little forming stars. Galaxy, little forming galaxies, they lie along a cosmic, this cosmic web, not, not at random in the box. So if I could measure the distribution of this atomic hydrogen and how that changed with time, I could learn about these galaxies, when they formed, I could learn through, by looking at how the, um, how the atomic hydrogen is clustered around these galaxies, I could learn about how big they were, uh, other properties like that, very basic properties that we'd like to know about the earliest galaxies. But how can I study atomic hydrogen? It's obvious how, do I, it's obvious how I study a galaxy. I can look at it with a telescope. I see uh, light coming at all these different wavelengths. But if, if I've just got atomic hydrogen gas, how can I look at that? Now, atomic hydrogen gas has actually played a very important role in, in astronomy for, for some decades now. Um, and, and, it, and the reason is that it can, its location can be traced through, through something called the, the 21 centimetre line using radio telescopes. So I'm going, to, I'm going to spend the next part of my talk talking about how we can use atomic hydrogen to trace uh, the, the, the properties of these very early galaxies. We're not going to be able, I've said, we're not going to be able to find them by just by looking with, with telescopes. Even our James Webb Space Telescope is not going to be sensitive enough to find the very faintest galaxies at the very earliest times in the universe. Okay, so if I, if I look at my uh, cartoon of the hydrogen atom again, I've got a proton and an electron. The proton and the electron are in orbit, but they, they have a property called spin. They can be, and so they have, they have two directions. 
and they can be aligned, the directions, or, or opposite. And those two states have a very slightly different energy, and that, that energy difference corresponds to a, a radio wave with a, a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So this is a frequency of, of 1.4 gigahertz. So this was, it was, real, this was realized um, in, in the 40s, um, and uh, by a, a PhD student called, called Van der Holst, and, and he realized this, and if that wasn't enough for a PhD, he, he realized that, that um, there was so much hydrogen gas in the galaxy that you could actually observe this, because, because an individual hydrogen atom will give you one of these very weak radio signals uh, every few million years. It's not something uh, that's, that's, that's very bright, but there is so much gas in the galaxy that, that this could be observed. So this is a, a very good PhD, and when my PhD students are uh, you know, thinking they're having quite a hard time, um, he did this in, in exile, essentially, uh, after his supervisor had been uh, taken off by the Nazis during the war. So, difficult times. Um, Australians have been uh, involved in, in study in radio astronomy at, at the leading edge um, ever since that time. Uh, they measured, made measurements of, of of hydrogen in the galaxy some, some, just some weeks after it was first discovered. Um, and, and, had, and by 1954, had made maps just a few years later, had made maps of the Magellanic Clouds in, uh, using in hydrogen. Um, this was a, a map that was made uh, by the radio astronomers in Sydney. Um, these are the Magellanic Clouds, and you can see on a dark night outside that, that, that radio waves. Um, so this is a, a map of Magellanic Clouds that you see today. This is in, in the in the atomic hydrogen 21 centimeter line made with the Australian telescope. And the thing that's striking about this is that it looks nothing like the, the object that you see with your naked eye. So ne next time you look at the Magellanic clouds, um, try and remember what this picture looks like and, and compare it to what the stars look like. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the closest galaxy. What's that got to do with the, the, the furthest away galaxy? Well, if it's the atomic hydrogen that gives you the, this 21 centimetre line. It's the, the electron has to be in the ground state of, of the hydrogen atom. It can't be ionised gas. Okay. So, in the nearby universe, the only place to find atomic hydrogen gas is inside a galaxy. But I said that after the cosmic microwave background was released, the whole universe was full of atomic hydrogen. And that atomic hydrogen was falling into galaxies and and forming the stars. So if the whole universe is full of atomic hydrogen and not ionized hydrogen, then the whole universe uh, should glow in this 21 centimeter light. And so if I look um, at this box I, I, and make, try and make a map of it, like, just like I make a map of the Magellanic Clouds, I'll see um, these features that are forming. I'll be able to, uh, if I had a good enough telescope, I could make a map of what these bubbles look like. And I could compare them uh, to the locations of the galaxies uh, that I see with the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. <laughs> now, this is not now being observed at 21 centimeters because, just like the uh, just like the visible light or the infrared light that's coming from these very early galaxies, the, the radio waves are, are also redshifting, and so they've, they're not observed to be at 21 centimeters wavelength. They're observed to be at two meters wavelength, and this is. Uh, 200 megahertz, which is which is a frequency that that we use for, for communications, um, and it, so and for this reason, uh, the telescope needs to be built in a, in a very quiet location. So I'll, I'll talk about the telescopes in, in the new telescopes in a minute. I want to briefly mention uh, about what about radio interferometry. So if I'm making an image of a of a galaxy with a, a telescope. I have a camera, and I, so with a telescope I have a lens, the lens can focus the light onto a, a focal plane, and I have a CCD camera, it can, uh, it can make an image directly. In radio astronomy I don't have that, if we're, we're measuring voltages of, of, of power from radio waves, the technology is quite different. And so if I want to make, uh, and, and because, the, because the wavelengths are so long, my telescope needs to be much bigger, kilometres in size, and so the process for making uh, an image is, is quite different. Now, 
If I, I'm going to go back to the war one more time because I find this story fascinating. So radio astronomy grew out of radar research in World War II, and someone called John Bolton was a, a radio operator um, on, on, on one of the British ships, and he came back to Australia to, to the radio physics labs in Sydney. Now, what they, what they were doing, of course, was using radar to, to calculate the distance and, and the direction to, to planes coming, coming in across the channel, the English Channel. But you'll know from people who did, who did physics at, at, at university at least will probably remember something called Lloyd's mirror. So if I, if I have light um, at point A and I'm measuring it at point C um, and I'm measuring the intensity, and I put a mirror up at B some light, and allow some of the light to go to bounce off that mirror and come back and be observed at C. When I, my light is, I can think of it like a wave. Okay? And so if I have two, I've got light coming from two, direct, from two paths and then being observed at once. If the, if the waves constructively interfere so that the up and down parts of the waves add together, I'll see a bright spot. If they're opposite, I see a, a, um, a, a dark spot. And so as the mirror moves up and down, I see the, the, the relative length of travel, or the relative time that the light's travel change. And so, so I will see a change between whether I get constructive interference, a bright spot, or destructive interference, a dark spot. And these are called fringes, and, and the fringes are, are plotted on the right there. Well, this will happen, happen with the radar too. The radar doesn't bounce off the plane straight back to the ship, but some of it goes down to the water and create fringes. And so what, what they observed was, was, was radar intensity that got bright and dim with time um, as, the, as these were constructively and destructively interfering. And they realised that they could use this to, to calculate the height of the plane coming in as well as, its, as well as its distance. So why is that relevant to radio astronomy? Well, back in Sydney, some year, a few years later, this technique was used to measure the locations of the first extra uh, the first astrophysical radio sources, the first cosmological radio sources. And here's a plot, as the Earth rotates, the path length from, from, the, from this X-ray source changed with time as it bounced off different parts of the ocean, and you see the fringes here um, as, the, as the, using the interference of the ocean and the direct path to measure the location of the, of the sources. Now, that's not what we do now, of course. What we do now is use many telescopes, a series of telescopes, like in this case, uh, 10 telescopes, the Australian Telescope Compact Array, and, and by adding up all the pairs, you can, have, you can have different path lengths for light and interfere them electronically. And by using many pairs and allowing the Earth to rotate the telescope under the source, you can fill in a virtual aperture some kilometres across. And this is how you make uh, radio images by adding up all of these uh, interference fringes. And this is the uh, Australian Telescope, and then you can make maps like this. So, how do we do that for, for this early hydrogen gas? And why haven't we done it already? I guess there are, there are three reasons, um, and for these, for these reasons we need, we need a new telescope. The first reason is that is, is, is to do with the frequency. So the frequency of, is, is 200 megahertz. It's a much lower frequency than we're used to operating on when we look at the 21 centimeter line in the local universe. It's lower by a factor of 10. And, and one, one thing that this, this, this creates a few problems. One problem is that it means that you need a, a larger, a wider telescope to get the same uh, resolution. It means, but it, more importantly, it means that the ionosphere is, it creates a large problem for you. So as the photon, as the radio waves travel through the ionosphere, uh, you, you, they, the ionosphere bends the path and makes your image very fuzzy. So you can't spend uh, a half a day waiting for the telescope to rotate with the Earth under your piece of sky because during that time the ionosphere is wiggling your image around. You need to be able to make an image straight away. And for that reason you need many antennae. So not ten, but, but hundreds. The, in, we're not, instead of looking at a galaxy, which is a fraction of a degree in size, we're now looking at, we need to look at many degrees of sky at once in order to see these very large ionised regions that are created around the first galaxies. And so we need to see large part of sky. This also call, this calls for 
small antennas, not large dishes, because they can only see a small fraction of sky at once. We actually need a small uh, antenna, and for that, and if we want to have enough sensitivity to collect the signal, we therefore need many antennae. So the type of telescope being built is, is shown here. This is, uh, this is the Murchison Wide Field Array, um, and it's, it, this is one of, of 128 tiles. You can see uh, the central 30 or so uh, in, the, in the desert. This is a, a telescope that's located in Western Australia, and it's, it's taking uh, data to do this experiment right now, and, and, this is, and this is one of the primary uh, activities at Melbourne at the University, actually, led by Rachel Webster. And <coughs> This is a precursor telescope to the, to the Square Kilometre Array, um, an artist's impression of which is shown there. This is a, a, much, a much bigger uh, instrument, which is, which is currently in the planning. It's an international endeavour. So, these, we will use these, these telescopes to make a map of, of where the atomic hydrogen is around the first galaxies, and we'll see these very old uh, radio wavelength radiation, radio light, uh, coming from the atomic hydrogen, and we'll try and we would like to try and use that information to understand when the first galaxies formed, how large they were. To do that, we, we, we need simulations. You, our, just as in the case of the cosmic microwave background, we can make a beautiful image, um, and, and it's, it, that is the universe, and we can, we can look at it. But if we want to understand what it means, we need to connect it to, to, our, to the physics. And to connect it to the physics, we need simulations. So at the moment, simulations have been used to try and motivate the sorts of experiments that we should try and do. In the future, they'll be used to interpret the data. So I'm just going to show you one example to try and illustrate how this works. So this is a, a simulation uh, performed by, by some of our postdoctoral researchers here at Melbourne, and it's showing um, in, in millions of light years on the side, a, a sort of slice of a, of a simulated piece of universe. And you can see the regions in white. These are where galaxies have formed, and they've, they've ionized the hydrogen, and they've left the blue hydrogen, with, which still has its electron, still emits 21 centimeter wavelength radiation, and can be observed by the Murchison White Field Array, or the SKA. There are two simulations, one on the left, um, the physics that's been put into the simulation produces primarily large galaxies. The, the, or the, the high energy radiation from the stars is coming from large galaxies. On the right, it's coming from small galaxies. And you see, uh, you see the difference by eye. And, and this is an extreme example to make this obvious. The size of the, the statistics of, of where the ionization has occurred is going to be different. So if I can observe these and observe this difference, then I can learn about those galaxies. Were they, were they large? Were they small? When did they form? And so on. And so this is a, a simulation which, which doesn't show up quite as well on the screen as it does on, on the computer, but it shows after you've processed this, this simulation, which is, just, which is um, just showing you what the signal is in, in, in perfect detail, if you pass it through a telescope like we envision the SKA square kilometre array being, you can see what you would find, dark patches and light patches, um, with statistics which you could easily infer the difference between these two simulations if you had that, if you had those observations. So once we see, once we start to see this kind of map, then we can use simulations to infer what that means about the first galaxies. So just to summarise then, this is, this is the, the next uh, great phase, I guess, in terms of uh, trying to understand the first galaxies. We've, we've pushed the limit of, of observations with, with, our, with the Hubble Space Telescope in particular, finding earlier and earlier galaxies at larger and larger distances and pushing back that frontier all the way to just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, to a time really not very long after the very, very earliest galaxies could have formed. But we start to reach a bit of a horizon where, where the telescopes required to, to pro progress are so large and so expensive that even the next generation of space telescope is not going to be able to see all, all of the sources there is to, to see. But those early galaxies, even the ones we can't see, will influence the universe around them. And in particular, they'll influence um, how the atomic hydrogen left over from the Big Bang will be ionized and heated. And we can observe that through uh, the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen. We can use our new generations of, of 
of telescopes, the Merchison Light Field Array and the Square Kilometre Array, to, to observe this distribution. And we can use simulations to try and understand what this means for the populations of galaxies that we have that we're unable to observe. So I've described tonight uh, uh, a kind of a cosmic archaeology, light travelling uh, through time, tells us the full history of our universe, all the way from, from just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang to the present day. In, in analogy with, with our own history, there's a kind of cosmic dark age. So we know a lot, actually, about the universe at a, and its very early infancy at the time, that 300,000 years after the Big Bang. We know very precise detail what the universe was like at that time. We know quite a lot about the universe uh, today, but we know very little about this time in the middle um, when, when galaxies were first forming. And these are, these are referred to as the dark ages of the universe, the time when light Universe first galaxies were forming and they were, were um, forming first, they were illuminating the universe for the first time, if you like. So we're entering an age of enlightenment with our new generation of radio telescopes. These are, are going to allow us to um, observe the effect that these early galaxies and stars had on the high of the universe and, and, and finally begin to shed some light on those dark ages for us. Thanks very much. Yeah, so so I, our, we haven't um, we haven't run our simulations forward, but people certainly certainly do that. And um, and and as you as you go further, what you find is so we're, we're in the early universe up until the, in the first half of its age, the the, dy the dynamics of the universe, how fast the was expanding, and, and how fast matter was forming into larger and larger objects, was was it. So the universe was slowing down, matter was falling in faster. As at later times, um, we believe dark energy is now starting to dominate the, the dynamics rather than mass. And so the universe is now accelerating. This is the, um, the accelerating universe that, that we've, we've heard about, that the Nobel Prize was won for a few years ago. And because of that change in, in the dynamics, objects, there's now a, a kind of horizon where if objects are not close enough together, then the gravity won't bring them together. Ever. So, so there's regions of the universe where the structure formation can keep going. So for example, Andromeda and the Milky Way will eventually uh, merge together. But there are other galaxies which, which are too far away. And so, so you won't have, you stop forming new larger and larger systems. At some point you, you're left with, with systems. And then if you go far enough into the future, those, those isolated formations will be so far apart that light will never have time to, to get from, from that object to another one. And so if, you, if, you're, if you're unfortunate enough to be a cosmologist in 15, 50 billion years from now, there'll be absolutely nothing to look at. <laughs> Um, 
They are, but they need to be at high density. So if, um, yeah, so, so molecular hydrogen is very important in, in, in forming galaxies. And, it, and in fact, to form stars, you need the, the molecular hydrogen. But you, you, if, you, if you're at low density, then, and then the molecular hydrogen can be destroyed very quickly by, by radiation. And so, but once it's destroyed, it can't form again because it needs the, the, the rate of interaction is too low. But once the hydrogen gets into a galaxy, yes, it will form hydrogen. So the yeah no, fair enough. So so the um, so the, the atomic hydrogen is is opaque to a very particular wavelength, and it's the, it's a, it's a very narrow wavelength at um, twelve hundred and sixteen angstroms, but like one angstrom wide. And so if the if the radiation is longer than is longer than that, then the universe just keeps on redshifting it away, and so it never encounters. So it can travel. So those photons can travel freely through the atomic hydrogen. They're not, they're not absorbed. It's only the photons which start at higher energy and redshift through that magic wavelength that, that get absorbed. And so, so, so the photons, all the photons are, so the universe is opaque to all the photons while it's full of dense, and it's very dense and it's full of electrons because the photons scatter off the electrons. Once you have atomic hydrogen, those low, those long wavelength photons are free to travel to the observer. Now, if you if you wait until the gas has been reionized, now there's electrons again, and so you ask me, well, why isn't the universe opaque there? And it's because the universe is now um, by that point, it's a it's a factor of many uh, or millions less dense, and so so although um, uh, some fraction of the photons do actually hit an electron, about uh, Ten percent of them do, and you can measure that in the microwave background. It's one way of determining when this event happened, actually. Um, so you see that, but it's a, at a much lower level because the density of the universe is so much lower. Um, so the, the question was: um, Is it can? Uh, is it conceivable that there are more objects that out there that the light hasn't had time to reach us from? Um, so, yeah, ab absolutely. So it's so what we what we see is is so it, is a, there's some, you can't think of the universe. You, if you think of a sphere inside the cosmic microwave background, you can't think of that as the entire universe. That's the bit of the universe that we can see because the light has had time to travel from there. Um, but the, the, the bit of universe that that, where that light has travelled from the microwave, across the microwave background, doesn't, it's not, it doesn't look like that. It now looks just like this part of the universe. It has galaxies and planets in it as well. And so if there's an observer on that world, they're looking at cosmic microwave background from here. And they can look equally far in the other direction and so on. So that's as long. As, so that's as if that's as old as it is. Yeah. Then that's as then 13.7 billion light years as far as we can look. Um, but that doesn't. But it's and and we're not looking at it as it is now. We're looking at it as it used to be. So so there's there could be galaxies for a, like you know as many times that distance as you want, um, and we wouldn't we wouldn't we would never be able to see them. Uh, yeah, my question is, you had some simulations uh, running in some cube uh, that wasn't expanding. So do you ever run simulations in something that is... Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So that, that cube is expanding. In, in the, so in, it's not on the film, because if it's expanding on the film, it's very hard to watch it. So, so what you do is, when you show a result like that, is you, um, is you take out the expansion. So, so when you calculate the gravity, and stuff, you, you do have the expansion, but when you show the film, you you remove the expansion and show it as it at, at fixed size. If that makes if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing about those simulations is that they're a cube and the universe is not a cube. Um, and so what you're, what you're doing is you make a cube which, on which that face matches onto the other face. And you, when you calculate the gravity, you wrap it around to, to the other side so that it doesn't, otherwise it just falls in on itself. Like 